Good morning. It's certainly good to see everyone out this morning. Certainly, if you're visiting with us, we want to welcome you and let you know that you are our honored guest. And we would invite everyone at this time, please, if you would, to fill out an attendance card. If you are a visitor, fill out the red side of that. Regular members, please be in the habit of doing that also. It helps us to keep up with the attendance and who's present. You can pass all of those over to the center aisle at this time. Now, if you've been gone on fall break uh, a lot, go ahead and fill out the membership side of that. You're not a visitor yet, so... It is good to see everyone back, and, and we know we still have some out, but hopefully everybody will be getting ready with the fall approaching, and it's certainly good to have everyone with us this morning. We're gathered here, and we're going to worship Lord, our Lord and Savior in song and in prayer, hear a message, and commune around this table, and, and certainly we want to know that everything that uh, you can do to participate in this service is certainly uplifting to each and every one of us as we fellowship together. If you're listening by way of WITB radio or on the web, we would like to welcome you also. And if again, if you're visiting, you need a nursery, uh, those are provided. You can go down the hallway to the right in regard to that. In just a moment, we'll stand and Scott will continue our song service. I'll read one verse here from Acts regarding the church and how it has prospered in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. And certainly that's what we're trying to do in the church today. We certainly want to be multiplied, we want to be uplifted, and we want to worship God and have that fear uh, of the Lord as we worship him with the same love that he has extended to us. Stand now and Scott will continue us leading us in song.
Would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning, for this opportunity to, to gather with the saints without fear of retribution, Father, in this holy temple, Father. We thank you so much for um, the freedom to, to do so this morning. Father, we thank you for all the elders and deacons and for Mark and the lesson that he will bring to us here in a few moments. Father, we pray for the Pertle family as they, uh, as they travel here in the, in the coming weeks, and we pray for the for the youth group and for the kids and that they would have a quick bond and that they would grow together father and we thank you for travis terrell and for jennifer and for all they've done for us at this congregation uh, for the last decade father pray that we would continue to show our gratitude towards them for their service to this church father we thank you for all of the people that have become quick to help the hurricane relief over the last few weeks. Father, I ask that as we hear the messages and we leave, that we would send the message out to other people, the one that we hear today, that we would maintain the attitude throughout the week and encourage each other to do so. Father, as sometimes it's so easy to have on this day until you go out into the real world. We ask for the continued prayers of those that are on the list. And we ask for the continual forgiveness of our sins every day. And we ask that we would always remember that you're the keeper of our souls. In your name we pray. Amen.
few thoughts before we partake of this ceremony this morning. I'd like to uh, look at Paul's comments again in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25. Paul received directly from Christ the commandment that this memorial supper should be uh, partaken of diligently. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is a remembrance ceremony, a reminder. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Our Lord is returning. And we need to be prepared for that returning. And so to help us, he's given us our worship service and the Lord's Supper so that we might at a proper time focus on his death, but also the fact that he will return. And of course, we know he told us through the apostles, he is building a place for us to abide there with him. Such a future. We cannot imagine it, but we try. Second Peter 3, I would like to look at Peter's, the Apostle Peter's second epistle, chapter 3. He starts at chapter verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Both of his epistles were reminders because we are forgetful. We're human. And so we must have benchmarks and reminders and that's why we come to church often because we don't want to forget our glorious God, our precious Savior, and the comfort and the abiding that he can be with us. And so, as we continue reading, verse 3 through 6, he cautions, knowing this, says Peter, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming, Jesus Christ? Scoffers are going to say, Christ isn't going to come again. And of course, they don't even believe in Christ so much of the world. But it's to their doom, and it's sad, but we have such a rejoicing that we know that Christ died for all the world, that if we live according to his direction, that we can walk the streets of heaven together with him forever in an abode that he has built for us. And so it won't be uncomfortable, it will be for us. And Peter continues, and they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will willfully, those who want to sin, willfully forget their God. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So the modern world does not believe in the creation by God, does not believe that there was a flood, and even when they see the rainbow, they don't honor God by it. And so, isn't it wonderful that we're believers, that we're here to honor our Savior, that we can worship Him, and hopefully in the right attitude and in the reverence, and let us do that now.
Only God, as we come before your throne, we come in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we know that we're sinners. So we ask you to forgive our sins, cleanse us and hear our prayer, receive our worship, and we trust that you have as we continue our worship in this Lord's Supper. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this bread representing our Savior's body, help us remember that he died for us. Help us rejoice that he came up from the dead and he did it for us and he promises us that we too will be raised and that we can live with him forevermore. Be with us as we partake of this memorial bread. Amen. Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ as we partake of this fruit of the vine. Help us do so reverently and we praise you and we thank you for your sacrifice. Help us walk properly before you.
known to God, even as those instructed in the first century so to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Christ's holy name, we ask that you watch over our hearts and our actions each day and that you just have that we've been thoughtful in what we can present to you, Heavenly Father, in our giving and that it might be truly a gift and help us in that for we have to think about that because we have so many responsibilities but we know that if we trust in you there can be as a gift to you be with us heavenly father amen scripture reading is chosen this morning is Judges 5 verses 1 through 9. Judges 5, 1 through 9. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord, God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, 
when you marched from the field of Edom. The earth trembled and heavens poured. The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord. This Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted and travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then there was war in the gate. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is the rulers of Israel who offer themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. It is excellent to see everyone here. We have our first wave of people who have come back from a fall break, whether you have to work, you ran out of money, whatever it is, we are glad that you're back. It's good to have everyone back, and uh, it's great to have this opportunity to be able to study God's Word and to worship together. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles, Judges chapter 4 and Judges chapter 5. What you'll see here in the early parts of the book of Judges, especially this passage, is oftentimes what will happen is a judge will speak and then they'll sing a song, especially here with Deborah. So Judges 4 and 5 are equivalent. They teach the same story. It's just chapter 5 is written in poetry, while Judges 4 is written in narrative. And so I chose chapter 5 for the scripture reading because the names weren't as long. And so that's a little bit of what I was after as we went through it. As you've noticed over these past few weeks, we are studying through the Judges. And we're looking at them from the aspect or from the perspective of each one of them being superheroes. And remember we talked last week about how just about every culture needs superheroes, needs somebody to look up to, needs some sort of mythology that they can relate to and that they can think about. And so for us in our culture, oftentimes we look at the Marvel comics or DC comics, we see Superman, we see Batman, Thor, and Iron Man, and things such as that. And it's sort of an escape for us to look at. And what we see here as we look through the book of Judges are a set of superheroes. Now, each one of them, and you'll notice each week as we go along, each one is a little bit more flawed. Ehud last week, very few flaws. We saw the uh, physical deformity which he had. Deborah, no flaws at all. But when you start getting to Gideon, when you start getting to Samson, start getting to some of these others, you find that they have quite a few flaws. But here's the point. God uses them Every single time. And no matter how flawed we may be, no matter how short we may be as far as what we're trying to do, recognize this lesson from the book of Judges. God can use us. He has great ability to use us, whatever it is that we've gone through and whatever it is that we're experiencing and struggling with. But as we look at it, I want us to look at Judges from a perspective overviewing it with something that we see throughout the narrative of Scripture. And that is the idea of dealing with loneliness. Now, as you and I think about loneliness, you see, perhaps this is seen throughout Scripture. And it's interesting when you and I go through the Bible, we see throughout the Bible different characters of Scripture who are struggling with the aspect of loneliness. Now, we see that in our present day world fairly clearly. You look at just about every one of the mass murderers or the shooters which we see going across. Sometimes they would have an acquaintance, sometimes they would have a friend, but in almost every situation you see an aspect of loneliness, of feeling left out, feeling like things have not gone well in their life. As we look today at one another, we see that many people here today, and it's the same way every part of our culture, are people who are dealing with loneliness. Sometimes they may be in a crowd, they may be in a family, such as Deborah was. She was married to a fellow named Libedeth. And yet you see in the work when she was doing, nobody else would rise up. And she was called to do the work herself. And so sometimes we find ourselves lonely because there's not a significant other person in our life. Sometimes we find ourselves lonely because our parents are gone or because of our children are gone. Sometimes we find ourselves lonely, even in the midst of a family, even in the midst of friends, 
when we feel like other people are not taking responsibility and we feel like we are wrestling with life alone. If you feel that way, recognize Scripture speaks to your situation. As you go to the very beginning of the Bible, you see God creating the earth. And as he creates the earth, he says, it is good. He creates the sun, the moon, and the stars, and he says, it is good. He creates the oceans, he creates the land, and he says, it is good. He creates the plant life, he creates all the animals, and he says, it is good. And he creates man, and he says, this is very good. But we get to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And we see the very first problem of Scripture. And the very first problem is not sin, which is very interesting. Because most of us, if you asked us, if you asked me, usually I would say the very first problem that came to the world would be sin. That's what expelled everybody from the garden. What's the very first problem? God says it is not good that man should be alone. You see the wrestling with loneliness? And now if we travel through scripture, you see the wrestling of being separated from the God and from others. We begin to go through the scriptures and we go to, uh, let's say, Genesis 8, 9, and 10. You see a man named Noah. A man who with his family preaches for almost 120 years. God saves him, his wife, his children, and their wives, eight souls total from the sin of the world. But what do we see after they get out of the ark? You see Noah wrestling with some very deep things, <clears throat> whether it be depression, whether it be just the trauma of what he's been through. And you see where he and his family are torn apart because of that idea of being alone and because of the idea of what they've gone through. You go a little bit later, Genesis 18, you see a guy named Lot. And Lot just had the opportunity, or not opportunity, he just had the occasion of seeing everybody he loved put to death. Even his wife turned into a pillar of salt. And as he is outside of that city, thinking he's the only one left, you see he and his daughters, and you see what happens to them. Because the aspect of thinking that they're all alone. You fly through scripture and you see a fella named Joseph, who is ripped away from his family. And what he goes through as he is brought by providence to Egypt to save his people. But you also see Jacob, his father. And his father, as he wrestles with loneliness, and as he wrestles with, even though he's thinking he's smarter than everybody, going through life and going through the struggle and not having anyone with him until he has an opportunity to meet the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord changes his name to Israel. We go to the greatest of the prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah. 1 Kings 19, and you see after he destroys the prophets of Baal, and he should have been on top of the world, he goes alone. And he says, Lord, take my life. It's not even worth having. Why? He thought he was the only one left who was faithful. He dealt with loneliness. And we could spend a lot longer, but I'm only allowed to preach so long, so we'll fly a little quicker. We go over to the New Testament. You see a fellow named Jesus, right? The very Son of God. The one who created everything. The one who could read people's hearts. The one who had the apostles who followed him everywhere. And here he is with his three closest friends... James and John and Peter. And he goes to the garden. And what happens? The three of them go to sleep because they're tired. And as Jesus is wrestling with the greatest thing he'll ever face, as the greatest battle between good and evil rages, the Lord prays alone. And it's he and God going back and forth, speaking about that cup, which should pass. But the Lord said, nevertheless, Lord, not as I will, but your will be done. And as you and I go through Scripture looking in that way, what we see is a fight. It's a fight between good and evil, but it goes deeper than that. It's a fight between fellowship, oneness, being with the people you love, and a fight in feeling like nobody cares. And a fight in feeling like you're all alone in your struggles. And a fight feeling like it's you against the entire world. And we have to recognize that many times people in our culture, people in our churches, feel like they're going through a very similar situation. 
And there are times where we ourselves are like the Lord, praying, and yet we're alone, praying that God will be with us. Now, if you've ever felt that, and if that is what you deal with, and that is what you're going through, read Judges chapter 5, read Judges chapter 4, and notice how Deborah has to stand up for God when no one else will. Notice how she makes the decision that God's will needs to be done and God's enemies need to be cleaned out. Even though Barak, even though many of the people of Israel would not stand up, she made the decision to stand up. And that's actually what the book of Judges is about. God calling people in the midst of wickedness, in the midst of danger, in the midst of laziness, if you will, God calling people to stand up and to save their country, save their family, save their church, because they will take responsibility to do God's will. That's our lesson on loneliness. That kind of over, over uh, arches what we're looking at today in today's lesson with Deborah. But as we begin to study about Deborah, we'll go to our next slide, we'll see there in verses 1 through 4 that here we have a judge, and she is actually a judge who's doing her job, which is a rare thing. As you look at Gideon, you see very little good work done as far as him overseeing disputes happening in the country. You look at Samson, you see a man who's very lazy when it has to deal with other people. He enjoyed killing Philistines, really didn't do anything else. But here you have Deborah, who is in the northern region around the area of Ephraim and Manasseh, who is judging the people. Now, we think of a judge as somebody in a robe who slams down his gavel and decides whether people go to jail or don't go to jail. That's not the idea of a Bible judge. A Bible judge was someone that you could go to and receive advice about God and somebody who would arbitrate different disputes. And so we see a lady who is doing God's work as people are coming to her and talking to her. And you see a lady who is very faithful, a lady who is... Uh, does not have moral issues like most of the judges will. She is someone who is doing God's work. Now, there are some times where people will take this passage and they'll twist it a little bit to their own ends. And sometimes you'll see Deborah which, uh, referred to when people are talking about the idea of gender equality in the churches and different things such as that. Notice this is an Old Testament passage, first of all. Notice that's not what this passage is written about, second of all. And notice it's not in the New Testament. When you're looking to see what God wants in the Lord's church, read in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 2, looking at verse 1, you see that all men everywhere, that's the word anthropos, which means mankind, men and women, are called to pray for all people, especially those in authority. You get to 1 Timothy 2, 8, instead of anthropoi being in the Greek, the word is aner, A-N-E-R. That is gender specific. And what Paul is saying in that passage is, 1 Timothy is about the church, by the way, church worship. What we see in that passage is Paul is teaching Timothy that he wants men to lead the worship services of the church. We also see that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as well. And so as you and I look at Deborah... Don't let people take this out of context and make it mean something it shouldn't. But instead, recognize what we have here is a person who is standing up and doing God's work when no one else will. She is a lady who is a superhero because she is willing to take responsibility and do the things which God has called her to do. All right, let's go to our next slide. And as we look here, we see going after verse 4, starting in verse 5... She calls Barak, who is the leader of the tribe there, the leader of the northern part of Israel. And she says, you need to go and deliver the people of God. Sisera, who is an evil king, an evil general, had brought down himself and had put oppression upon the children of Israel. Now we see he was a very powerful man. He had 900 chariots of iron. Think of a chariot as being an Abram's tank. It is the... Uh, superior in that day of military technology. And not only did he have them, he had 900 of them where he could swoop down and destroy whatever Israel would put against him. And Deborah calls Barak and says, you have a responsibility as God's people, as the leader of God's people. Your job is to stand up and do what God has called you to do. Take 10,000 men 
and go against those chariots and you will be successful. Barak thinks about that and notice what he says. I'll go if you go with me. I'll only go if you take care of it and do this responsibility. Oh man, have you ever seen somebody that way? You tell them what they need to do and you show them God's word and they're like, oh, I might need to do that, but I really don't want to. Maybe in household chores, you see yourself and your family and everybody should have a role. Everybody should have a work, right? (coughs) But boy, you find yourself doing laundry every single day, right? Or you find yourself cleaning this or that or whatever else household chore you may be thinking of and people are just not taking responsibility for what they ought to be doing. How often do we look around in the church and there are obvious things which need to be done, but nobody rises up and nobody does them. Nobody is willing to take the initiative. Nobody is willing to say, okay, this needs to be done and I'm going to do it. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to stand up and fulfill this work. Instead, sometimes we find ourselves like the apostles in John 13. They see everybody's feet are dirty, but they sure aren't going to trouble themselves with doing that work because maybe it's beneath them, maybe it's something they don't like, whatever it might be. And so Barak says, I will only go if you go with me. Deborah, I don't want this work. I'll take the glory of being a leader of Israel, but I'm not willing to take the risk, I'm not willing to take the responsibility to go and do it. And so because of that, year after year after year of Israel goes into captivity, goes into oppression. And God cannot be praised because God's people are not willing to stand up. Do we see that in today's world? Oh, we absolutely do, don't we? It is so visible in today's world. As you and I look at our country... One of the reasons why we have so many problems, especially in national politics, is because the right people won't run for office because they know what happens to politicians. And they know how terrible that situation may be. One of the reasons why we have the people who push the culture in the way they push it is because good and righteous people will not stand up and take responsibility of saying what is right and what is not right. One of the reasons why in many of our families we have so much discord and so much trouble is because husbands refuse to do the work of husbands, wives refuse to love their husbands, children and parents all refuse to do their work because we have an entertainment culture. We have a culture which wants pleasure but doesn't want responsibility. And people are not willing to stand up and fulfill their God-given role. One of the reasons why we have trouble in our churches is because people have forgotten the opportunity to read the Word of God and to know what it says. In the book of Hosea, Hosea looks upon a nation which is just a shell of its former self. And as he looks among his people, he says, speaking in God's role, God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. We're raising up generations in the Lord's church who don't understand what the Bible teaches about salvation, who don't understand that the Lord's church is not a denomination, who don't understand how to share the gospel and how to be baptized and be a Christian because parents have failed in their role. They've been too busy doing something else. We don't have a people who stand up for those things which are morally right because we've been too busy doing other things, and looking in other directions. Far too few people rise up. Far too few people take responsibility. Way too few people are willing to stand up and do the Word of God. As we look across in our country, our families, and our churches, we see the shortcomings of so many in doing God's work and being what God has called us and wanted us to do in everything that's around us. We look there in Isaiah 5.20, and we see Isaiah speaking of his culture, his country, in much the same way in which we can. He looks around and he says, woe to them, curses to them. They find those things which are good, and they pick on them and call them evil. 
And then they find those things that are atrocious and evil. And they call those things to be good. We look in our churches and we see those who, like 2 Timothy 4, beginning of verses 2 and going through 4, we see where they say, folks are looking around and wanting their ears tickled. They're wanting nothing more than entertainment. They're wanting nothing more than to feel good about themselves. And because of that, they will not listen to sound doctrine. They will not repent of their sins and live the way that God has called them to live. How many of us can relate to that? As we look in our families, as we look in our church, as we look in our country, how many of us can relate ourselves to Deborah and see that far too few of us are standing up? And far too few people stand in a gap. And far too few people take responsibility for what God has placed in them. But then we go to our next slide and we see that there is a leader who will stand up. And it's not the leader that you would think would come. It's not your natural leader. You have Barak, who ought to be a general. That's what this leader was. But he was afraid. But he finally got his 10,000 men together. And you see where he should have led the people against the enemy. And because God is going to be with them. And of course God was. God worked in the same way which he always does. As you read in chapter 5, you see what happens. The armies array together. And before they fight, the Lord sends a storm, a flash storm, if you will, a flash flood. And it creates mud, it creates problems for those iron chariots. Those iron chariots begin to sink into the soil, and no longer are they usable. And so the people of uh, Sisera's army begin to run away, because there's no way they can stand against Israel's army. God has delivered the nation to Israel, like he always does. But as Deborah had said earlier, the glory would go to somebody besides Barak because he was not willing to be a leader. Sisera, as he runs away, goes into a tent of Jael, a person who should have been on his side. Her husband actually was fighting with Sisera. And as he goes into that tent, he asks for protection. He says, I need you to hide me because I'm having trouble in this fight. I need time to regroup. And she says, well, come on in, right? And instead of feeding him water, she feeds him warm milk and she lets him lay in her lap so he can relax. And as he goes into a deep sleep after that battle, here we go back to the middle school aspect of some of the judges, right? J.L. pulls out a tent peg. You can imagine the spike which was there. And as women had the responsibility in that culture of putting up the tents and taking them down, this is something she was very, very good at. And she puts that tent peg at J.L.'s temple as he sleeps. And she drives it through his head and puts him to death. It's very interesting how the Bible puts these things. The Bible says he drove, she drove the peg through his head, nailed him to the ground. And then it says, and he was dead. <laughs> like, you think? Really? But anyway, it's neat how the Bible sometimes will say that. And he is dead, of course. Well, what we see here. God raises up a leader from places that you wouldn't expect. Now, does that apply to today? Absolutely. Our nation has risen up leaders which do not follow God and do not always do the things they should. But that doesn't mean God's weak. It means God is working in a different way. And leaders arise from places you wouldn't expect. There are times where you'll have a wife and a mother whose husband doesn't come to church. But guess what? She stands up and takes responsibility for her children. And she brings her kids to church and makes sure that her children know the way of the Lord. She's an example to those children. And we read in 2 Timothy 1.5 about a lady and a grandmother, Lois and Eunice, who took a young boy and made sure that he knew the scriptures, even though his father was a Gentile. And through the influence of those two sweet ladies, God raised up a leader who became a preacher in the early church named Timothy. God raises up leaders from places you wouldn't expect. There are times where God will raise up a leader in a congregation, not necessarily from the eldership, not necessarily from the pulpit and a preacher, not even from the deacons. 
But God raises up leaders in every single family and in many of the membership of people who will stand up for the word of God and will make sure that God's word is proclaimed and make sure that this church's faith is seen through the community. There are times in our culture where our kids and others need to see what it means to be a Christian. The rock stars and pop stars don't do it. The athletes don't do it. The people that the world holds up don't do it. But God has raised up Christians to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth, to show other people what it means to be a God follower. And he calls each and every one of us to stand up for the cause of God. There's a beautiful passage in talking about this. In just a second, I'll remember where it's at. 1 Samuel 17, verse 29. That's where we're at. 1 Samuel 17, verse 29. You have a little guy named David, right? David was, even, was not even allowed to go to the battle because his older brothers were the ones who were supposed to represent Jesse's family in this fight. King Saul was there, and King Saul even had great armor, and he was a representative of Israel. But he wouldn't fight. Why not? Because it was a giant they had a fight against. A man who was nine feet, six inches tall, and everybody was afraid of him. And so, for 40 days, everybody quivered. When David showed up with some bread from his father, and he snuck up to the front line, and he heard Goliath and his charge that he'd given every single day, and he said, why hasn't anybody gone to fight him? Why is not the king or anybody else over there? And the brother said, you have no responsibility here, David. You need to go back home. Notice what David says, 1 Samuel 17, 29. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? What David says is nobody is going to speak about God that way. And even if he is a young man, even if he is inexperienced in the ways of war, even if he cannot wear the armor... Nobody is going to speak about God in that way, David would say. And so he himself goes out and faces Goliath. Once again, God raises a leader from a place you wouldn't expect. And I hope that that's what this sermon inspires us to say. There's a cause. There's a reason. I, you, need to stand up and be a leader in my situation To be God's people in my culture, my time, and my situation. It's time for each one of us to take responsibility for God's call for us today. We are called by God to take responsibility. To stand up and to be the JL, to be the Deborahs, to be those who, while other people may discount us, to be God's people in this world. It's not something we leave to anyone else. It's something that we ourselves are called to accomplish. We're called to support God's leaders. We read in Hebrews 13, 7 and Hebrews 13, 17 that we have an obligation to support those who have rule over us. The context there is pointing to elders. And what we see there is the obligation that we have to support those in a leadership role. Those who are elders, and I think contextually also we could say in Hebrews 13, also preachers of the gospel. To support them in their work, to raise them up in the things in which they do. We also see the importance as we look at this situation. And as we get ready to close this lesson about recognizing the power and the difficulty of loneliness. Because what we see here with Deborah is a lady who is doing her work. But she's called on to accomplish more than what she's called on by God. She was to be a judge under that palm tree, arbitrating decisions. Telling God's people what they needed to do. Balaam, you need to go and fight. Or Barak, you need to go and fight this battle. But there are times where we're called to go beyond what we may feel is reasonable. And when that happened, Deborah went beyond to accomplish God's word. 
There are times where we look around and we see people perhaps in our families, people perhaps even in our churches, who aren't living the way they should. And it causes great discouragement. And it causes great trouble. In that situation, we go like Deborah and we step beyond to make sure God's work is done. To make sure that we can be what God would have us to be. What I want us to do as we go to our last slide is to encourage us to be like JL, to encourage us to be like Deborah, to take responsibility for our situation, to make sure that God's word is taught in our homes and taught in our, around us, to be sure that we're doing what God has called us to do. There's not room in the Lord's church for laziness. There's not room in today's culture for God's people to be slack. We must recognize the cause of God and we must do what he has called us to do and put him first and foremost in every aspect of our lives. This morning, if the invitation applies to you, if you need to obey the gospel, we ask that you come forward while we stand and while we sing. Thank you, Mark, for that great lesson, and uh, we'll review in just a moment an opportunity uh, for us to serve God in some service opportunities. I want to go ahead and mention, though, at this time, those that are in need of our prayers, and then we'll have our prayer, and I'll give the general announcements. Sharon Stegall received great results from her MRI last week. We need to continue to remember Sharon in our prayers. Ollie Faircloth, the four-year-old grandson of Lana Phillips' cousin, is undergoing chemotherapy treatments at this time at Vanderbilt. We want to continue to remember that family and that child in our prayers also. Lexi McCarty, the niece of Jane Hines, is in critical condition in a hospital in Tucson. She is improving but in still need of our prayers also in regard to that. Florence Robertson will be released from Superior Care tomorrow and return to the Steely House, so that is good news for Florence. We want to continue also to remember Penn Reed, Matt Burkeen, McKenna Lovett, and Bob Hines. All of these are, are recovering from surgeries. And when you look in your bulletin, you'll see a large list of other names noted there. Continue to remember all of those families, all of those individuals and their families and the doctors that are, and people that are seeing after them and helping them in all those situations. At this time, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for the opportunity that we've had to study a portion from thy word and engage in this worship service. Father, we pray that everything that we've done this morning is in spirit and truth, and we pray, Father, that our fellowship has been uplifting to you and that our fellowship has been a bond for one another. Father, we're mindful of all of these that have just been mentioned, 
and all of those that are listed in our bulletin. And we pray, Father, that you would bless them, that you would heal them, that you would continue to strengthen them in each of their various needs, Father. Be with their families, be with those that are attending to them, their doctors, nurses, and staff. Continue, Father, to bless this congregation as we seek to draw closer unto you and do more in this community. Continue to bless us all is our prayer in Christ's holy name. Amen. Our general announcements, and there are several here, please pay attention to the bulletin and refer to it in regard to some of these dates. I know that it is very difficult to hear these things and to keep it all in your mind. So most all of these, except one, perhaps is in the bulletin. Uh, but we want to, to mention them this morning. You're cordially invited today to an open house from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Exceptional Center. It's on Sims Old Sonia Road. Refreshments and individual performances will occur there. And I know that you would bless them and be blessed by attending Exceptional Sunday there. On Saturday, October 21st, you're invited to eat at Lambert's. They're asking for everyone to try to be there by 1030. And then a visit to Beggs Farm. Admission there is $11. And you can see Aaron Lyles for any of those details in regard to Saturday's trip to Lambert's and Beggs Farm. Next Sunday on October 22nd, this is the first of three opportunities that we're going to mention this morning for service, which certainly cor correlates to Mark's lesson this morning. So next Sunday, the Freed Hardeman Chorus will be here to sing, and they'll do that after our 1 p.m. service. So next Sunday, after you go eat, after the a.m. service, we're going to regather at 1 p.m., and we'll have a service there, and then that the Freed Hardeman Chorus will follow that. So we're in need of volunteers to provide lodging for approximately 37 students. And that list is on the bulletin board. So let's make sure that we can accommodate these, these young people. So you can sign up and please note boys or girls and how many that you could uh, have at your home. The church is providing their dinner meal after AM services next Sunday. So all you'll be required to do is pick them up here at the building at, at 8 p.m. on Saturday night and take them to your home where you can provide a shower, hopefully, and bedding for them. And then they'll get up and come to services with you that next morning. So remember, that sign-up sheet is on, in the foyer on the bulletin board. That was the first opportunity to serve. The Pirtles will be planning on moving to Benton on October the 28th, the following Saturday. They hope to arrive around 11 to 12 on that Saturday. For a time period here, the Pirtles are going to temporarily reside in the parsonage of the Fairdaylin Church of Christ. They have graciously extended that to their service, and we certainly appreciate and thank them for that, while they will we'll be looking for a permanent residence. So you know where Fairdaylin Church of Christ is. If you go down the bottom of the hill and turn right, it's the first house on the right. You could even park at the church and walk over there to assist with them unloading their belongings. Now, they've sold a lot of stuff, the washer and dryer and heavy stuff like that, I believe. So it should not take too long, but we're going to need some people to help them unload that trailer and get moved in on October 20, 28th uh, from 11 to 12 o'clock or so. In regard to the Pirtles also, uh, we discussed this a week or so ago. It's not in the bulletin yet. We're going to have a welcome meal after our PM services on Sunday, November 5th, the first Sunday of November, uh, for the Purtles. So we're going to get together. The church will provide the meat, so sides and, and desserts are requested for the, from the congregation. And we thought that it would really help them and assist them by giving them a gift card shower. So that's going to be pretty easy to purchase a gift card 
they're, they're going to be needing basic things that they could get at Walmart or somewhere like that. I'm not telling you everyone to get a Walmart gift card, but uh, we're going we're gonna to try to really, really make sure that they feel welcome by helping them to unload, by having a PM get-together for them where we can all fellowship together. And I know they're going to be extremely grateful for the gifts that they can and the things, the necessities that they can purchase with a gift card. So be thinking about that on November 5th. Uh, the, October 29th on that Sunday, we're asked to join other churches of Christ across America to pray for Potter's Children's Home and all the children across the area. So we want to remember that. Also then on October 29th, we'll have an adjusted schedule on that Sunday. Also, it'll be our annual trunk or treat. The singing service will begin at 4 p.m. The chili potluck is at 5.15 p.m. And the trunk or treat will begin around 6.30. There are sign-up sheets also on the bulletin board for that in the foyer, but hopefully in the classrooms also. So we're going to need a lot of chili. And the candy buckets will be placed in the foyer for you to donate individually wrapped candy for the trunk or treat. So three opportunities to serve. Housing the Freed Hardeman Chorus, helping the Pirtles to move or to move in um, on, the, on that day, the 28th. And then on the 29th, to, to decorate your car, your trunk, we need people to sign up for that. And we need people to bring chili and candy in regard to that. Just a couple other things. All ladies, be reminded, a new class has just started on Wednesday nights in room 52. You're invited to join them. And also for this week and, and throughout the, the fall and winter, I suppose, if you're a member and you're in need of a ride to the doctor, please contact the church office in regard to that. We'll try to make sure we have all of these reminders in the bulletin and then daily updates. Certainly been good that we have served God this morning and praised God. And we look forward to our Bible classes. And at this time, we're dismissed to those classes. <laughs>